to make the glyph or the, the, the logo of Bluetooth. So you're connected to Harold, Bluetooth. Now he was quickly dethroned by his son, um, who was known as Schwen's uh, for, Forkbeard. So it, was, it, was, it wasn't, it wasn't a, 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 a safe job. But the connections, this building, when we conceived it, is, it, it's the Convergence Building. And we wanted to bring people together. Uh, the pandemic was quite a challenge, but we're so glad to have people uh, gathering today and to talk about connections. So the panels we're gonna have, we're gonna talk about smart cities and how they connect individuals, devices, technologies, et cetera. <clears throat> we're gonna talk about the connections that can come from new technologies that are leaving the lab and are going into, in, into um, actual work that we're seeing out here, whether it's a lawnmower or an autonomous uh, vehicle, lab to life, and then talk about the next generation of connectivity and what that will require to make it happen and what it will do for the world. To get started, I'd like to turn it over to Mike Klein. Mike Klein is re <clears throat> responsible for um, so many things, I, I probably can't list them all. Um, he is responsible for many administrative functions, the safety uh, at Purdue University and all facilities. Um, so I'd like to turn it over to uh, Mike Klein. Thank you, Brian. It's great to be here. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Michael Klein, and I am the Senior Vice President for Administrative Operations here at Purdue. And as Brian uh, mentioned, there are a number of things that, that falls into my responsibility that my, my great team. And I'm uh, just so pleased to have the chance to uh, say a few words um, as we get started today. Um, I want to introduce um, Stephen Goldsmith. Uh, before I get to the paragraph that's prepared for me, I just wanted to acknowledge that many years ago, uh, as a young um, engineer, Purdue graduate, I, I worked for the city of Indianapolis uh, under uh, Mayor Goldsmith's administration at the time, and um, it was a great place to get started, and I learned an awful lot there that has helped me uh, cascade forward and throughout my career. So, um, Mayor, thank you for that opportunity, and, and um, uh, as we think about today, you know, the, the mayors have so many uh, job responsibilities and what they must do, and then they have choices to make. And I think, uh, I'm guessing today on the panel, we'll hear some of those things. So without uh, further ado, I'd like to say that uh, Stephen Goldsmith is the Derek Bach Professor of the Practice of Urban Policy and the Director of the Innovations in American Government Program at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. He currently directs Data Smart City Solutions, a project to highlight local government efforts to use technologies that connect breakthroughs in the use of big data analytics with community input to reshape the relationship between government and citizen. He previously served as the deputy mayor of New York and mayor of, the, of Indianapolis, where he earned a reputation as one of the country's leaders in public-private partnerships, competition, and privatization. Mayor. Very, very few folks who worked for me ever admitted in public. I was really, this is quite interesting, Mike. Did Mitch know that before he hired you? Uh, but I have three distinguished mayors. Let me invite them to come up and have their seats here. We have uh, uh, Mayor Faddis from Fishers and Mayor Lynn Hope, Lynn Hope from uh, Columbus and Mayor Muller from South Bend in no particular order. Height first, I guess. I'm just going to lead a discussion. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, Purdue does such remarkable work in the general area, uh, engineering generally, but in the world that I work in, smart cities, uh, Purdue is a leader as well. Um, in my little project at Harvard, I've, I have frequently asked for uh, Purdue professors to make uh, presentations to the mayor's groups that I bring together from around the country. So thank you for all, and particularly uh, Glad to be here. I've got a slide presentation that takes about 75 seconds just to set the stage. And uh, then we're going to have a discussion with these uh, three mayors. So um, you guys, 
have a deck back there. Let me just, I want to just, uh, I just want to frame the conversation in the following way. So we, have a, we are talking about smart cities, particularly in the heartland, because we're in the heartland. But I, I want to uh, just start with a quick framework. One, and we'll get into this with our three distinguished mayors, um, it's easy to talk about technology, and I write a lot about it, but uh, we ought to start first with why do we care, right? What are we trying to accomplish? And so this slide uh, doesn't tell you anything you don't already know, but I just wanted to begin with it because the mayors that are here and the mayors that we work with around the country are mayors because they want to do X, right? And the X is maybe a more livable city or more sustainable city or a healthier city or a safer city or more prosperous city. And then the question is, how do we use technology and analytics to accomplish those goals. So I, I like to start with this slide just to kind of say, this is the so what is, and too many times we get embedded or involved with city officials and they, uh, they're they less excited about technology until they think about the so what. Okay, next slide. We're quarter done with the slide presentation. Um, I'm not gonna read all this. There is no real definition of smart city, so I made up one um, just to have a frame of reference and. Uh, for those who actually care about this sort of thing, it's it's on our website. But basically, it covers how do we use the digital tools to work smarter? How do we create digital platforms that, cr that bring together systems? How do we use those systems to protect, to produce public value? And then how do we, how do we protect the systems that we're building, privacy and security, which are obviously huge issues as well? So there's a little definition of a smart city to begin with on the issues of connectivity. Next uh, slide. Um, so if, this is the last slide, and just to frame the conversation, I know the panelists can't see it, but, but we could think about the advantages of smart cities in any one of these four quadrants. Uh, up on the left, um, how do we create digital platforms for asset management? How do we manage our assets better? Um, the speakers will have uh, examples of that, and of course Purdue is known for that as well. Um, and, but assets don't just mean the physical structures, right? There's a lot of assets in the city that can be brought together through better platforms. On the bottom left, how do we operate better, right? How do we use digital tools and technology to produce more public value per dollar spent in our cities? Cities are under a, a, a lot of pressure to do more things. Um, and so how do we operate better? Up in the upper right-hand corner, how do we use smart city tools analytically, right? Um, uh, how cities, I was mayor of Indianapolis, the same is true of the mayors behind me. We have a parks department, we have a street department, we have a police department, we have a, a solid waste department. But people don't live in the solid waste or parks department, they live at 10th and Main, right? And, and they need to organize activities and solutions around where they live or where they work. So how do we create a, a analytical opportunities from digital tools? And at the bottom right is, um, the goal of the exercise isn't just to see how smart we can make the people who work for the three folks behind me. It's to, it's to say we also can create platforms that allow for more community engagement so that individuals in their communities and neighborhood leaders have tools, have visualization, can see things in order that they can have more input. So the conversation today is about asset management, it's about operating through systems, it's through analytic capacity, and it's through citizens at the center, and we have three distinguished mayors who are gonna solve all those problems in the next 47 minutes. Thank you very much. All right, so with that, um, we were having a little conversation out um, before we walked in, and so, well, first of all, this has to work with first names. It cannot work with mayor, uh, mayor, mayor, right? So, we'll, we'll, so there's no sign of disrespect, but Scott. Um, uh, you made an interesting comment, I thought, really interesting comment, which is before you get to technology, you've got to have the data structure correct. So talk a little bit about what you're doing in Fishers. I may, have call, I may call them cultural issues, or you might call them data integrity issues, but how are you preparing the data to allow it to be more utilized? Then we'll go through, you know, South Bend and, and Columbus are gonna dump a lot of data through anal, uh, sensors on top of what you have today, but start first with, well, how do you get your team to use it? Well, thanks, Steve. Uh, so four or five years ago, the technology was actually outpacing what our organization was capable of consuming. And so we were getting hit up by vendors to put a device on this and a device on that and a device on this. 
but we really didn't have the organizational structure or the capacity to take that information and turn it into something meaning, meaningful for us. And what we realized is we started to embark in our journey is that we actually have thousands of points of data already existing within city government today, but we didn't have the architecture in place to be able to take that data, process it, and turn it into something meaningful from an information standpoint. So we had to really look at enterprise software applications that really focused around the centers of data creation in city government, people like HR, they, there's lots of data points for the people you have. Money, finance, lots of data points for that. Infrastructure, law enforcement, and land use were really kind of the core principles. At the time that we evaluated this, we had probably 200 software applications doing a variety of things, none of which were complete or providing the information that we needed to really make informed decisions. So our work on, I guess, for lack of a better term, the Smart Cities Initiative didn't start at the end point. It started back with, okay, how do we put an architecture in place that allows us to gather that data in a way that people can pull it together and say, okay, now we can make informed decisions. When we got to that point, we realized we don't have the people to do that actual part of it. So we had to go hire a team of people that are what we call a uh, business solutions group. They are data analytics people. They're, uh, informed in data manipulation, data understanding, and then they also work on software implementation. So for us, the journey started, and it's been a long, hard battle to get to that point. Started there, and uh, honestly, the biggest challenge was taking that group of people with those tools and convincing all of the other departments that the interaction with those individuals were of value. And I think we've made a lot of strides there. We have a lot of different uh, projects going on in a variety of departments, but Steve, to your question, it, it really started there for us. This uh, I issue of, of shifting a workforce so that it's, it, both you have to move the data and the workforce to do these things. Um, um, Mayor, I can't do Mayor Jim because there's two of you. Uh, South Bend, let's start with South Bend, then we'll go to the other Mayor Jim. Um, so there was this mayor before you, I can't remember his name, uh, <laughs> right, Dan, South Bend, developed a reputation as being very advanced as cities go with respect to using data. I remember you were one of the first to have sensors in your uh, water, in your uh, uh, wastewater systems in, in, for CSO purposes. But uh, talk to us uh, a little bit about, um, we're in the home of the country's preeminent road engineering uh, school. Uh, talk to us a little bit about how you're using robotics and analytics and sensors with respect to pavement and uh, streets first, please. All right. Well, thank you. And, and it's good to be here and, and join you here in Lafayette. But uh, yeah, the, my predecessor immediately uh, was a, a good friend of mine, the Mayor Pete, now Secretary Pete. And the, the sewer system that you mentioned actually predated uh, you know, his tenure too, and it was really the, our public works director that took it on to, uh, to start innovating uh, in our sewer systems. And, you know, we, we claimed for a while there to have the smartest sewers in the world. And uh, getting to your slide that you, you mentioned, the why, uh, we, were, we were under a consent decree for combined uh, sewer overflows, and uh, it was going to be very expensive on our ratepayers. And fortunately, with, because of those sensors, we were able to renegotiate that uh, that uh, agreement. Well, I mean, the agreement with the EPA and the federal government's a little different. It's kind of you will do this and, and uh, you <laughs> sign up. So, but the agreement, we came to an agreement, and uh, you know, the new plan, we can save, we'll save ratepayers over four hundred million dollars, and we'll uh, you know lead to better environmental outcomes, over twelve percent uh, reduced E. coli. Uh, outflows into the river uh, per year. So that, that's an important part. And then, uh, you know, going in, in, I served in Mayor Pete's uh, administration as chief of staff and really Mayor Fadness is uh, about building the infrastructure and the, the team. Uh, you know, there, there are a lot of stories. There's a case uh, study online about how uh, we built the innovation and technology team in the city of South Bend. Uh, but, you know, like, like a lot of cities, I imagine, there were IT people scattered, uh, you know, throughout different departments, and they didn't have a lot of specialty or expertise. They kind of were just there to help people, you know, window, whatever, win, whatever Windows operating system you're on, like some, you know, <laughs> employees, how do you do that? We didn't have Microsoft Office. You know, we didn't have any cloud storage. Our, our server was underneath. There's a story of our server was uh, 
had a tarp above it with a leaky pipe. Uh, so, you know, the level of, of where, where we started and where we are today, uh, really, you know, building this team and, and building the business analysts to, to both analyze and keep track of the data, but also figure out how to successfully implement software solutions. So those are critical. And then just quickly, uh, you mentioned about the streets. Right, let me interrupt yeah. you just for a second. Yeah. Because we want to get to the, the fancy stuff. But before I do, um, uh, under Pete, uh, the city had one of the countries, the, your city had one of the country's preeminent CIO CDOs, a guy named Santi, who came originally from Notre Dame. I just for a second before we go on, yeah. how do you think about university city partnerships in smart city, right? I know you're working on one with Purdue. You've had long had one with uh, uh, fellows or interns from Notre Dame. Just address Scott's comment about people in the sense of how you partner with the university? Well, that's been a, a critical story for us, uh, you know, the last 20 years or so. The University of Notre Dame, uh, for most of my lifetime, you know, it kind of had an inward look and over the past two decades, started a little bit before Mayor Pete, but really took off in the past 10 years, um, you know, started to engage the community and, and form that partnership. We're proud to be part of the Metro Lab. Uh, network uh, that was founded, uh, you know, about 10 years ago or so to ha establish that relationship further and share best practices with the uh, city university partnerships across the, the country. Uh, you mentioned Santi, uh, another good friend of mine. And, and yeah, so in focus was a program that we uh, set up in South Bend to help uh, retain talent uh, from our university. And he had been a graduate of Notre Dame's uh, esteem program. Uh, which was a science, technology, and management, entrepreneurship, and management uh, program. Uh, Co-founded that institution, then ultimately became the city's first uh, chief innovation officer. And that's when I came back, I moved back home to South Bend in 2015. He was chief innovation officer with uh, Office of Two and the scattered uh, department. And so we had to figure out how do you bring all these pieces together and build up uh, the infrastructure to, to do what we wanted to do. Um, and then he moved to Pittsburgh. He actually came back uh, in my administration to be uh, uh, economic development uh, uh, you know, for, for, uh, for me. And then now he's off to Boston under Mayor Wu to be uh, Boston's, uh, I, I forget exactly, but chief innovation officer. So uh, I'm gonna, let's get the other Mayor Jim in and then I wanna come back to your uh, uh, robotics. You worked with your roads, but um, you've made a number of Jim, operational improvements using smart city tools, GPS and the like. Would you tell us about those? Yeah, the, just to follow on with, the, like you talk about pavement. I mean, one of the things that we realized early on was that we canvas every inch of city streets once a week. It's called a garbage truck or a sanitation vehicle. So we drive every mile, every inch of the city once a week. And so we've got eyes on the whole neighborhood. And part of what we want to do is have a little device up here on the ceiling where the driver sees something, pushes a button, drops a pin. It might be a tree. It could be a chuck hole. It could be a car that uh, you know, needs to be moved or hasn't moved for a while, but sends a message back so that we've got somebody to come out and take a look at that. And, and the comparison is that if we don't do that, say, for instance, with respect to chuck holes, what we've got to do is send a crew out to drive the city and look for chuck holes. Okay, so it gives us an opportunity to be much more focused. And, and I can't tell you right now, Columbus has got about 425, 430 full-time equivalents. We're down about 20 people. We've got about 20 open positions right now, you know, 5% of our workforce. And so anything we can do, you know, that will make us a little bit more productive, a little bit quicker, you know, we're, we're gonna be all over it. Uh, you know, we've already had our guys looking at the automated moors you know, that we're outside and, and we're gonna do that kind of thing because we've only got 30 baseball diamonds, right? We've got about 20 soccer fields. And so to the extent that we can employ that kind of technology to make those people more productive, well, that'll take care of our personnel shortage. A few of the other things that I talked to uh, Mayor Goldsmith earlier about was, um, in Columbus, we've got a very diverse population. About 20% of the city of Columbus is either foreign born or second generation. And so the language spoken at home is not English. The school corporation tells us that the number of languages spoken at home unique in Columbus is around 54. 
And so if you're running a police department or if you're running a, uh, a fire department or a, a first, you know, uh, first responders, you know, you need to be able to determine right away what the language is that you need to communicate. So we use a, a, a software called Language Align, and it allows us 24-hour access to, I want to say it's about 75 different languages. Um, because we can, we'll encounter, we, we've got Spanish speakers on staff, but we don't have Mandarin. You know, we don't have uh, Pashto. Uh, we don't have Hindi, you know, those kinds of things, which is what we need to be able to serve those people. Um, just to, real quickly, one other thing that we use, I mean, we've got a lot of projects going on around town. And it's very easy for us to drop a yard sign or a, a, put a little placard up that says, would you like to know what's going on here? You know, would you like to know what's coming? And what we can do with that is put a QR code on that placard so people hold their phone up there and voila. You know, they've got access to our, our, our website where we explain whatever it is that they're standing in front of. And we found that to cut down on the number of calls that we get at City Hall, but also just better inform the public. So it's, uh, it makes life a little bit easier as well as making us more productive. Thanks. Let's let's stay on the operation piece for a second, and then we'll go back to assets. Um, so we can think about operations in two ways. This is a, I guess a question to all of you, but we'll start with Scott. One is how data, when delivered a person in the field, makes him or her helps him or her work better. Right? How how they get more information on their tablet? How does it configure their routes? That sort of thing. And another is the autonomous mower garbage truck, um, robotic inspection of roads. So, Scott, let me start with you on the, on the people side, and then uh, Mayor Jim from South Bend, I want to go back to kind of how you're inspecting your roads. Well, I think the people side is about empowerment and the ability to solve issues or become more efficient at the point of service delivery. And that can be as dramatic as a police officer having the... Um, mental health emergency plan for someone who suffers with chronic health or mental health issues so that they can have a better outcome in a very intense situation all the way through to frankly an inspector in the field being able to fill out a form on an ipad and do that very quickly or look up a particular piece of information that they need so empowering that frontline person to accomplish the the task either more efficient or with a better outcome is always a key component and then on the back side i would tell you i mean there's like these very interesting questions of why and the ability to answer them that you never even knew you had to ask these questions before. Like in Fishers, I was just talking to our people at DPW the other day. They now track every acre that they mow. And they mow like 1,200 acres of grass a week. And the simple question you could ask yourself is, why? Why do we have 1,200 acres of grass? And does it make logical sense to spend taxpayer dollars mowing the same strip of grass over and over again when you could plant it into some sort of native planting and not have to mow 1,200 acres of ground. I mean, it's the basic why question, but those were elusive prior to having the data to understand that that was a question you should even ask. Mike Klein. So back in the 19th century when I was a mayor, we were into performance contracting, and so we, we, and we, we let out these contracts, and one was for mowing the right-of-ways. You were probably responsible for this story. And... Um, the team insisted, let's see, the, that we measure performance. So we required them to mow the right-of-ways every week, right? So think about this for a second. Do you really want your right-of-ways mowed every week during a drought? This is your question, like, what, what are we trying to do? So, so people would call in and complain to 311 that these guys are out there cutting the dirt, right? And so why are you paying them to do? But as contrasted to, I don't know, what, uh, what the amount of moisture is, and you, you want the grass to only be two inches high. So it's an interesting story, Scott. I hadn't thought about that in, in some time. Um, Mayor Jim, uh, the same, same subject, how do you determine... Uh, the priority for repaving a road. Uh, um, how do you use AI and robotics? How do you how do you create your priorities for what what you do in, on the ro roadside? Well, you know the the uh, the one thing that we I think every mayor in Indiana does, but we already have for a long time gone out and have people measure you know the conditions of the roads, every segment of road, and, and it's called a PASA rating, one through ten. Uh, you know, one being the worst, uh, 10 being, you know, brand new, the best. 
And, uh, you know, we're having people go out there and look at every uh, section of the road. So we did uh, work with a company called Robotics to use AI and you drive with a camera and, and uh, take images of the road and, and they can uh, then do the same thing, rate each segment of the road. Now, the, the challenge, and I'm sure other mayors up here and, and you probably never encountered this, but the, the state uh, tells you what you have to do. And so we have to do the PASER rating. So it'd be nice if we could work with the state to uh, allow the, this uh, technical solution to, you know, maybe you still do some spot checks or something to make them feel comfortable. But, you know, we haven't found any significant difference in, in quality of data from physically going out there and assessing versus this automatic, uh, the solution from, from robotics. Uh, so then that's, you have the data, uh, you have your data, you have your whole city, uh, what the conditions of every segment of, of street uh, is, and, and uh, then, you, then you have to figure out how to prioritize and, and the f funding you do have and uh, make sure that, uh, so one of the things we're doing in part of our rebuilding our streets plan is make sure that we're having equitable uh, you know, this, there are some neighborhood streets because road funding, uh, you know, hasn't kept up with the needs, whether you talk about gas tax or any other sources of infrastructure funding, we haven't had enough to cover our full infrastructure. So what happens is uh, those streets that are most traveled and break up faster, those get repaved, uh, you know, every few years, uh, but some neighborhood streets are, haven't been touched in decades. And so we wanted to make sure in a concerted way that we were having equitable quality levels of our streets across the city. And so we're, we're uh, starting with the worst and moving up uh, with the funding we have. And, and that also having this data helps you decide how much, instead of saying, oh, we're getting this much from gas tax or we're getting this much from the state, we say, well, how much does it take to get our, our ratings up to a level of service where there are no failed streets uh, in the city of South Bend and, and where there are quality that our residents expect. So. That's, uh, that's what data can do, but it can't produce the, fortunately it can't produce the money for you to actually get it done. Not so far. Uh, Mayor Jim Columbus, how, how are you thinking about uh, uh, sensors, robots, drones with respect to operations issues? We do, uh, you know, to tag on a little bit to what they do in South Bend, I mean, it, not only do you gather the data that rates the roads, but now you've got data that you can share with the citizens. And so when a citizen wants to know why their street hasn't been repaved, I can point to the 12 streets that need to be repaved first before we get to you. And it just makes it a little bit easier argument because it's not my decision, <laughs> it's the software you know, or the engineer. Yeah. Um, but you talk about uh, one, ways we use uh, um, uh, sensing. We've got uh, about 26 miles in, in Columbus of what we call people trails. These are uh, bicycle and pedestrian pathways. And uh, we're always trying to measure how well they're used. You know, do people really like this uh, amenity that we have? And so we've got a variety of sensors that are either infrared, you know, they're on the trail side or they're in the, the pavement, it's, it's asphalt most places. And it can tell us uh, which direction a person is going or it can tell us whether it's an individual or a bicycle. And it can give us a little uh, information on speed. And so we begin to understand a little better uh, how we design these trails and in particular, uh, maybe where some of the blind uh, curves are that, uh, that we need to watch out for. Um, another place that we, we uh, uh, talk about this is uh, with respect to uh, uh, just enabling remote workers, uh, you know, allowing uh, people to, uh, to work from home. I mean, a lot of what we do is interaction with, uh, with citizens. And so it, it becomes important for us to be able to make our people accessible. And so just something as simple as forwarding calls to a person's cell phone or to a person's home phone, we don't disclose you know, the number, but being able to facilitate the communication is critical in being able to allow the employee to work remotely. Any of the three of you using uh, bots to answer those phone calls that they just use, use IVR system so far? How about drones? Um, Jim and then Scott? We, we make pretty extensive use of drones. We bought them initially about five or six years ago for our fire department. And the, uh, the selling point was that uh, you don't always know when a fire is out. You know, you can, you can walk, you can look at it, and you can think that it's out, but uh, there are still hot spots, you know, often inside the building, and you're trying to identify those to make sure that it doesn't rekindle. What we realized really quickly was that these drones could also help us identify people. And so we've had several examples where we've found young kids uh, who were hiding 
either in a wood wooded area or in a cornfield. We'll take them out into the county. We don't, uh, you know, we don't stop at city limits. But uh, uh, we, we can also find bad guys, you know, who are trying to uh, to get away from us. And and I think we've had, in the, I'd say, in the five or six years we've had the drones, we've had probably double that number of people we've been able to locate uh, with their use. And and again, and, and, and you know, I hate to say it this way, but they're kind of fun. You know, so if we have a uh, if we have a celebration uh, in Columbus, you know, we fill the street with a bunch of people. Uh, it's nice to have a drone up there to uh, to let us know how big the crowd is and be able to put that on social media and just let people understand that there, you can have fun in Columbus. And, and here's an example. Yeah, I, I would just dovetail onto that that public safety has certainly been a a frequent user of it. Uh, you know, being able to literally, we flew a drone into a home where there was a murder suicide. And uh, they weren't sure whether the individuals were deceased or not. And instead of a guy going through the door to figure that question out, uh, they broke the window and the drone flew into the home, maneuvered and found the, unfortunately, the two people were deceased. But without that, you're, you're knocking through the door and putting someone, someone's life at risk. So that's, that was probably the most unique application I've seen of a drone so far. We have more questions for the, for the panel. I'm not sure whether I'm allowed to ask audience questions, but if you have a question, raise your hand. Is Luna out here somewhere? Okay, I, I, I'm your guest, so I don't. I doubt I can call on you. But you know, the the country's most interesting experiment experiment on um, materials driving sustainable results is the. Uh, US 30 project in Fort Wayne. I know we have Fort Wayne and Allen County people. Could, could I think so, you or one of these folks ought to summarize that for three or four minutes. It, it is really a re quite remarkable project. Yeah, thank you. I the U.S. intelligent highway by using zero carbon materials and AI technology for smart intersection. And we're also using the IoT sensors for traffic leveraging and AI guided algorithm for accident um, prediction. So the objective is to ensure we achieve four things, right? Sustainability, mobility, safety, and security at the same time. It's really a remarkable project. Why aren't you doing that? Well, you know, it's a great question. I'll have to follow up. I need, to, but you know, Steve, one one thing that brings to mind that I'd be interested to get your thought on as the kind of the, the originator of public-private partnerships in the world of infrastructure and smart cities. I think one of the innovations that needs to continue to evolve is this interaction between the private sector, the educational uh, components, and then the cities. Because that, that's a clumsy interaction oftentimes in, in how it, our cities are living laboratories. Under the right regulatory framework and under the right interactions, there could be a perpetual state of innovation that's occurring and frankly entrepreneurship to create new companies and, and innovate in an area that, to be honest with you, infrastructure has been ripe for disruption for a very, very long time. So I'd just be curious to get your thoughts and I'll reverse moderator here, but. I mean, what what are your thoughts about the evolution of that relationship? I don't I don't, I don't have to answer this question. <laughs> um, well, we're in a place that's trying to demonstrate that, so that's a great question. Uh, let me make the answer more complicated, though. So, um, as all the mayors know, and any of you who have ever tried to do business with a city know that the procurement process in cities is pretty archaic. Currently, it's designed so that you can procure just at about the same time that the technology becomes obsolete. So if you start today, you finish the uh, uh, procurement. So there's a procurement problem, but there's also an asymmetry problem in the following sense. This even goes back to the old days when, I, as Scott mentioned, I did, I did maybe 80 or 100 of these things when I was mayor, which is if what, what these mayors want to do is purchase from the private sector innovation. They don't want to purchase yesterday's asphalt or yesterday's contract, they want a concrete, they want to purchase innovation. The problem is they don't really know what that means. So there has to be a process that solicits ideas and turns them into a formal um, purchasing contract. 
The problem with that is that there is an asymmetry between the vendors and the city. They, they know more about their technologies than the city does. When I was deputy mayor of New York, I had somebody come in and pitch me a new technology every single week, and they all sounded great, and I had no idea which ones were real and which ones weren't. And so if we were really gonna support innovation at the city level with smart technology, there needs to be some way to, to provide the consulting or advisory services to the cities, which will advance the speed and process. Think about the conversation that Scott started in my, my, my story about the, um, yeah, about the, <laughs> about the lawnmower, that, the, the issues I asked my client about, right, which is, you know, how, how you measure performance. How do you measure performance in, with these technologies when you don't quite understand the technology? How do you build those service level agreements into the contract? So it's more than you wanted. It's actually an issue that I, I, I write about a little bit. This is the defining issue, right? The, techno the technologies are out there. The applications need to be done. The applications have creative mayors like the three that are up here, right? You can hear, hear by the way they talk that they're open to those things. But it's not an easy process if you raise your hand and say, well, I've got a solution to X for any one of the mayors to know, well, do you really? And I'm willing to take a risk with your company, but how do I know? And so I, th I think we need to change that. The state might be able to help, Purdue might be able to help in the sense that, you know, it's a little bit um, uh, Cranard School plus the engineering school. I mean, it's more than kind of one area. It, w it would make a remarkable difference, I think. It was a great question. What, uh, one question for you, then we'll go back through the others. If any audience members have questions, let me know. We've got a, a little bit of time. Left. Scott, you're, you've are you led in the state, um, I know the other mayors have done this as well, but you've, you've got a reputation of leading in terms of economic development built around digital and tech jobs. Uh, uh, explain how you've gone about that. Well, it's been intentional and it's been a long, long process. Uh, we started with really creating the infrastructure. So we, th we view public infrastructure very differently than maybe it was 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. Co-working spaces and uh, IoT lab, uh, all of those things we view as modern day infrastructure. It's not a seaport, it's not a railway, but it's a necessary infrastructure for innovation and the type of ec economy that we wanted to drive in our city. And then we were very intentional about recruiting the types of companies and the types of, frankly, entrepreneurs and tech entrepreneurs that we thought once you got a critical mass of those individuals, it starts a flywheel that really is self-perpetuating. On top of that, we, we really did try to put our money where our mouth is as a city. And we told all of those innovators and entrepreneurs, view our city as a living laboratory. So if you're uh, an individual with a new edge device that's for firefighter location in the middle of a fire, and you want to try to, to run that prototype through our fire department, we'll work with you. If you have a new technology for software uh, regarding EMS, we'll work with you. Um, we've done it in public works and, and we will continue to have that open door um, philosophy when it comes to working with entrepreneurs where we're willing to take those risks because as we talked about earlier, maybe we're not ready to write it in a bid document and maybe INDOT isn't ready to write it as a standard but somewhere in between there has to be this area for innovation and back and forth collaboration that leads to entrepreneurship and frankly, better products. I mean, we're still talking about asphalt with the same life cycle that it's been for, I don't know how long. Like at some point we have to disrupt these industries and, and hopefully through that environment we can do that. You know, the one thing the convergence uh, effort could do if, if they could connect their due diligence to INDOT's purchasing agreements, right? Any city can purchase off an INDOT agreement. So if, if the, there might be ways to think about this at, at, at scale. Um, uh, Jim in South Bend, let me switch up just a little bit. So one of the problems here is that this stuff's not free. And so there's a little upfront cost, which may extend the life cycle of the asset, but that's for your successor to benefit from, right? Not necessarily you. Um, pretend the audience is your budget director. Make the return on investment. Use your sewer example about how much, how you saved money, right? So that there's a language out here why this upfront investment produces savings. It'd be great to hear you kind of talk that through. 
Well, yeah, that's uh, obviously a limitation of our, our political system in general is long-term uh, investments uh, usually get enjoyed by uh, not the individual that's deciding to, to, or the individuals that decide to make them. So whether it's climate change or any number of our long-term issues, uh, debt, whatever you want to talk about, that's a challenge with the incentive. But, you know, I think the other mayors would agree with me too, is as mayor, you do have a little more ability at the local level to break through and uh, explain why long-term investments, uh, why we're making these investments, why they make sense. Uh, on this particular one, you know, some of it was, like I mentioned, uh, our public works director seeing this challenge and kind of squirreling away uh, dollars over the years to, to invest in this tech, you know, just slowly build that. Uh, not necessarily a big splash, not a big initiative, not necessarily a, a big line item in, in any particular budget. So it started kind of incrementally. And then uh, when the, the first consent decree from EPA came for our combined overflow, uh, you know, everyone was out, you know, this is going to cost us a billion dollars. And City of South Bend is just over 100,000 people, so you can do the math. That's a lot of uh, it's a lot of money to be investing uh, in cleaning up our river uh, because of just this specific issue with our sewer system. And so then the the public mandate was there. Obviously, once you saw this giant price tag, like, is there anything we can do uh, to save to save dollars? And uh, you know, working with the federal government, you, they ask questions and ask questions some more. And you know, we had the sensors, we had a model, and it still took you know, a number of years to, to get them to agree that uh, this was a better way forward. How do you think about that in Columbus? You know, I would add one component. It's not just all financial, but some people are scared of the technology. You know, and in particular, I will tell you that we have license plate readers. Uh, if you come to Columbus, we will know. Um, but, uh, but the whole notion is to try to find people who have uh, stolen a car or created a crime in another place, and now they're here. And so we can begin to look for them. Uh, there's a pushback you know, among the community about trying to adopt that kind of a technology that exceeds the cost. You know, the cost is almost secondary. Um, you know, with respect to cameras, you know, we've got cameras throughout our downtown area and uh, several public buildings. And, and the question becomes again, it's second to cost is, uh, you know, is that really something we want folks to do, you know, to have that kind of eyes on, on what we're doing. And I was really interested in the, the display earlier about the drones being able to, uh, to swarm, you know, above uh, a group of people, because uh, you know, candidly, we uh, we we live in a world today where uh, we have demonstrations, we have uh, uh, we used to call them protest marches, but uh, uh, you know, can those uh, you know, be maintained uh, civilly? And, and and so far in Columbus, we've had several of those, but they've all turned out really well. But but how do we make sure that that continues to happen? And I've often believed that people behave a little bit better when they know somebody's watching. So, you know, we, we embrace that technology, but, uh, but yeah, the, it comes not only at a financial cost, but sometimes you've got to have a long conversation with a group of people as to why it's okay to go ahead and do that. How are you and Columbus or any of the three of you using um, uh, signalization sensors for safety purposes or traffic smoothing? I mean, we pretended for a long time we've done a good job with that, but really it's not quite what you'd call real time, right? The sensors get installed and how, how many of your residents call to complain about long waits on the signals and the like. So how are you thinking about using analytics and more advanced sensors in that regard? Any of you? We, uh, we actually integrated, so every signal in Fishers is integrated into the same software platform and allows us to manipulate those signal timings real time. And then to your point about complaining about traffic, we also make value judgments prioritization of, you know, at 430, there's a certain road that we need east-west traffic to have the majority of the green time so that you make these priorities decisions that say, if you're a side street, you're gonna spend more time on the side street because it's a more efficient way to get traffic through. Uh, and we've had that now for uh, three or four years. And then you can use it as simple as there's a parade or there's an event, you can change those signal time. It's just from a laptop in the engineering director's office. Jim, Jim? We've not really had too much trouble with that. I mean, Columbus is uh, 50,000 people. The rush hour lasts about 40 minutes, you know, so it's, it's just really not been a problem for us. But we do have those kind of signals, and, and yes, they do get out of whack, so to speak, because they're not very smart. Uh, and, and so when the, when, the, when the power goes down, we've, uh, 
you know, we experienced some difficulties. All those have to back, somebody has to go back out and reset all those, and it's 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 a little troublesome for us. You're not having bike safety issues that are related to signalization. No. Yeah, Jim. Yeah, I mean, we have some signal actuators, but uh, generally traffic is not a, a huge problem in, in South Bend. We we've done a lot of complete streets work. That's you know change the the traffic patterns and it it doesn't you know maybe it's a couple more minutes i, I mean i see our former uh, meteorologist from south bend mike hobby he maybe can attest that uh, you know when, when we made those changes it may have added a couple minutes but traffic you can get from one end uh, of south bend to the other uh with you know 20 minutes it's not a traffic is not a big issue in, in yeah. south bend uh, so it's not it's not one of the issues that you know we've been looking to invest in uh, solving because it's it's not a huge priority for us makes sense questions from the Audience, right? Just speak up just a little bit. You've done a brilliant job with the IoT lab. Can you help explain kind of how that came about and uh, potentially what your vision is for that IoT lab in the future? Yeah, so the question is about uh, the story behind the IoT lab and Fishers. So as we tried to push the entrepreneurial movement and attract the next generation, the uh, economy to Fishers, we started with the co-working space, which is your traditional coffee shop, backpack idea, skinny jeans, you know, the whole, the whole cliche. Um, and that was going well, but we saw the, a pivot or an evolution of that movement into the internet of things. This idea that edge devices are going to transform the economy. And we really thought Indiana being the most intensive manufacturing state in the country, that there was an opportunity to develop companies that would either help in the process of manufacturing by implementing edge devices in the manufacturing plant or the development of devices that would be a part of the product that the manufacturing plant is making. And so we really wanted to link those types of data scientists, those types of technology to this, um, this economy that is kind of the foundation of uh, Indiana. The folks over there, they're entirely different than your software as a service developers. They're, they're uh, wonky. They're about wires and gadgets and things. And um, it's a longer uh, process to get to a product. It's been really fascinating to see. We have folks working on alternative energy methods. We have people working on security cameras. We have Bluetooth enabled technologies. Um, we see this lab continuing to grow. It's frankly, the lab space itself is full which we're excited about. Um, and we're, we're hoping to see our first graduation, if you will, of these different companies uh, into the local economy shortly. How are you thinking about the deployment of 5G technologies for purposes of, of uh, we'll go back to the last question, right? So you, 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 have, edge, you have edge and you have 5G, and if, let's say you're, you have a detection system that lets you see a bicyclist or a pedestrian coming along the way, are you explicitly connecting 5G, IoT, and city services? Well, for any of us mayors, 5G uh, technologies is a whole different conversation around small cell towers and what that all looks like from the deployment standpoint. That's a, a difficult thing as they start to show up in neighborhoods. This is the architecture piece that I think we got to spend a lot of time really thinking through. I'll, I'll share this. I had a mayor recently from Indiana he came to me and said, you know, we're all in on the smart city stuff. We're going to put all these sensors in the road. And I said, well, what, what is it that you're attempting to do? with it? It'll tell us the weather conditions uh, on the road. And I thought, well, I mean, there's, you can kind of know what the weather is relatively easily. And uh, it's cloudy. It's going to rain. It's 52 degrees. Well, later on, he came back to me and he said, Scott, that was a disaster. And I said, well, why was that? He goes, did you know you had to pay for a cellular service? for each one of those devices. And this is where I think we gotta take a step back and to your point about the partnership with folks like Purdue or others, that asymmetry can be really dangerous too. I mean, local governments, state governments have wasted billions of dollars on technology and software that were poorly executed and poorly implemented because they just weren't thought through completely. And so this 5G technology, what is, what is gonna be the standardized component of that? So if, if it's going to be a, a component of transportation, is there a set of standards that we should be looking at? I mean, all of that needs to be vetted out and thought through, or otherwise these become kind of pet projects that are kind of leaders or, you know, kind of glamour projects, but I don't know that they actually substantively move the needle one way or another. If you have a question, raise your hand. Let me, I'm gonna, would you introduce yourself and ask your question, please? 
Okay, yeah, I'm Shamali Shashi, Assistant Professor in Ag and Biological Engineering, and I had to talk on drone swarms this morning. So I was wondering, when you have like these traffic lights, it should be relatively straightforward technology-wise to learn from these traffic patterns. So do you actually have to uh, manually go in and change based on what you perceive as the traffic patterns? Another nice uh, extension of the drone swarm technology, which is now funded by, by NSF Courier, is that you can actually have swarms of drones see some of these traffic patterns and actually play sort of, even if you have like sparse network connectivity, they could be like sort of ways of in extending the network in very creative ways. And it's not new technology. We are applying some of that in our lab. So I'm wondering how smart are your traffic lights and traffic pattern enables uh, traffic lights? I would, in Fishers, the real-time signal system that we have feeds real-time data in terms of queue length, time at the signal, any malfunctions of the lights and your ability to manipulate that timing is there on the keyboard with a laptop. I think where the technology that you're talking about, the idea of using drones for, for some of this would be even more exciting and appropriate where lights don't exist. So the rest of the community, where so we with real-time signal systems, you can understand what's happening in that moment at that intersection. What you don't know is where are those cars coming from? and where are the originators of that traffic and where are they going? I think some of that, which is done traditionally through like traffic counts and modeling, it might be interesting to see how that would work from a drone perspective moving forward. Jim, uh, going back to comments you made about South Bend earlier to pick up on the question of Scott's answer. So um, many city, most cities today are concerned about equity issues. You mentioned this before. Um, and I'm interested in having you talk to us a little bit about how you're visualizing infrastructure investments using spatial GIS, A, and B, there is an interesting uh, way to think about this last exchange, which is um, getting lots of cars through poor neighborhoods faster may be good for the cars driving through faster, but not necessarily for the people who are have asthma or near carbon emissions. So how are you thinking about equity and infrastructure? And then we'll go to the other two uh, mayors for that same question. Yeah, I mean, as I mentioned before, the, our, uh, on the streets side of infrastructure, uh, we're looking at, you know, what are the ratings of our streets and going from the worst first and, and going up the list. And so what that does is, I mean, you know, equity doesn't mean equality. So it doesn't, or well, that means some investments are gonna go in areas that have been neglected uh, for decades. So right now, it's not an equal distribution of infrastructure dollars on streets, but to raise it to the same level of service across the city, that means we're going to have to invest more in some neighborhoods that have, have been oh, oh, neglected. I, I was a prosecutor before I was a mayor, so let's just do a little cross-examination here yeah, just yeah. for a second. So you've got your robotic AI thing, or Jim has his garbage trucks, and you, you see a, a hole... Does that go into, so I'm gonna type in my address that night into your open data GIS platform. Can I see that? Yes, there, I mean, this is all, so there's a couple of things that are, one, the potholes is the, you know, the, the stopgap measures to, to fill that. So we try to do that within 24 to 48 hours of being reported. Those go online to 311 data is uh, open data online on the website. But also our whole, the whole PASER rating and robotics ratings are also on a dashboard. Every segment of street, you can go on the map and click as a resident and see. And that's good because then we ask residents to say, if you think this is wrong, you know, let us know and we'll take another, you know, we'll make sure that this rating is right. So it helps us too when people, when residents uh, say, hey, I don't know, you're, you have this as a six and it looks more, you know, this was one of the worst roads that, that we travel on. So it helps to have that uh, feedback as well. Great. Jim, everybody? I would add that the data, we talk about this, the PASER system and the rating helps us diffuse the questions about equity. You know, because again, we're not taking care of in Columbus, we're not taking care of Tipton Lakes, or we're not taking care of Riverview. You know, we do it based on the numerical, gate, uh, excuse me, a numerical grade that the pavement has, wherever it happens to be. I'll offer a, a slightly different example. Right now in Columbus, we're contemplating a, uh, uh, an investment in broadband. We've got a company that's coming to town that wants to, uh, you know, build a broadband network throughout the city, one gig up, one gig down. And part of what we've talked to them about is digital equity. You can't cherry pick your neighborhoods. 
You know, if you're going to come in here and get a tax abatement or you're going to get some kind of government assistance, whatever it happens to be, you got to service 90 percent of the neighborhoods. And, and so, you know, they've been receptive to that. But we try to make sure that that uh, that that's that we tie that somehow to uh, to the project that they're under, undertaking. Scott. Well, we had a really embarrassing uh, component of this around snow removal where we were trying to be um, equitable and we were plowing in every corner of the community uh, doing snow removal because we thought, well, if we touched every corner at the same time or generally, you know, everybody got basically the same poor level of service, <laughs> then we'd be equitable. And then we were showing this to our mayor's youth academy, these high school kids, and asking them, you know, what would, how would you do this? And some student raised their hand and go, well, wouldn't it be best to just figure out where the densest populations are, where the most people are, and if you plowed there, you would affect the most people. That would be the most effective way to get people out of their neighborhoods. It didn't even, didn't even dawn on us that it's probably the approach, that's the framework we should look at is, how do you, how, what is the most efficient way to get the most people out of their neighborhoods the quickest versus trying to just be equal to everyone. So, I mean, that's a component of, um, I guess, equity that we were embarrassingly stumbled yeah. upon. Or maybe a lesson in humility too. Uh, <laughs> we have a question in the back. Nick Hamilton with Cisco. I'm actually on the follow on panel. Um, curious with all of this innovation, how are you thinking about cybersecurity in the context of the uh, House bill last year that was passed for cyber reporting? I'm from Maryland, we recently just passed some legislation just last week or two weeks ago, but just curious in how you're, how you're approaching that and uh, you know, rallying teams in the context of staffing challenges and all of the complexities that come with that. Well, this is a fascinating asymmetry question. Uh, the, and there's some really interesting work being done. There's a, a group out of Knowledge Services, which is a technology company in Fishers, and they're doing a, a, the equivalent of like a state ramp versus Fed ramp scenario and this professional association that would really tell all of the folks that are selling technologies to local governments, what level of cybersecurity are you guaranteeing that you're going to provide? Because so much of us, so many of us now are moving to the cloud and we're software as a service. So my IT director can talk to me about my network security, but does he have any clue with the 400 vendors or the 200 vendors that we now work with, what their security looks like? And do we have the horsepower to do that internally? Absolutely not. And so I do think this nonprofit organization where peer-to-peer -peer review and creating those standardization that says, well, you're to this level, uh, I think is a really interesting approach to trying to deal with that moving forward. Other questions? All right, so in the last five minutes, we'll, we'll start at South Bend and we'll come this direction. Pretend you're here 10 years from now. How are you then going to be a better mayor as a result of deployment of IoT sensors, technology, digital tools? What will be different in the way you provide services to your city? Well, wow, that's uh, that's a great question, and, and I think it it uh, goes back to to your intro slides: is what are our biggest problems uh, in South Bend, and public safety is, is one of them, and we're looking to implement a cloud-based real-time crime center uh, here in the next year. Um, so, you know, we would like to see public safety outcomes uh, go in, in a better direction and, and utilize technology. I think, and, and on, on that point of, of speaking to, uh, you know, what are the problems of the city? I think this is good for private vendors, as you said, when you were uh, deputy mayor of New York, uh, vendors come all the time, so both the the companies come all the time and, and also researchers at the university come all the time. And you know, a lot of times it's not a user-based interaction. It's a, I wanna try to figure out how to get funding to do whatever I wanna do. So I have this thing, I have this technology, can I sell it to the city? Does it work for the city? I don't know, does it solve a city problem? I don't know, I just need a, someone to buy my product. Or similarly, a, a, a researcher saying, uh, you know, I, I want to get money for my research. This is what I care about. Does it really solve or does it address the issues uh, of the city? So when we're, when we're working with, with cities and, and working together, uh, you know, it's got to take that user-based design of, you know, what are, we actually, what are the problems we're actually trying to solve and how might we be able to work together to, to do that? And, and I, not to criticize the question about the, the traffic, but you know, we just said we don't have a traffic problem in South Bend. And so you know, if vendors come and try to 
to pitch us uh, traffic solutions, we're going to say, well, this isn't our priority. But, but crime is. And so if there's something uh, you can offer uh, on that front, we would, we would love to talk. Good. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, you know, you think about 10 years, uh, we try to think that Columbus is going to grow 2%, 3% a year. So 10 years from now, we'll be 20 to 30% bigger than we are. Uh, I don't want our workforce to have grown by that much. I want to be able to measure the fact that we have grown the workforce at a lesser rate than that we've grown the population. And the way we're going to do that, hopefully, is uh, increase, pro increase productivity. My friends at Cummins can tell me, you know, how many hours it takes to make a diesel engine today. And that's like 10% of what it was, you know, 20 years ago. And so I want to be able to find that kind of productivity increase into what we do, and particularly with respect to crime. And, and as I mentioned before, you know, people tend to behave a little better when they know we're watching. You know, I had a, a conversation with one of our neighborhood watch captains uh, you know, a couple months ago, and all he wants us to do is to trim the trees so that the street lights will illuminate the streets a little better. You know, and it's a great example of what, what we're talking about in terms of being able to uh, uh, put uh, detectors, uh, whether they're motion or visual or whatever, uh, around the city. What that in turn allows us to do is to create what we call heat maps. It tells us where the, the crime is occurring and where we need to focus our, our um, uh, uh, resources in terms of our, uh, our police. It's an 80-20 rule with respect to crime. You know, 20% of the crime, excuse me, 80% of the crime is done by 20% of the criminals. So we want to be able to find those folks, go where they are, you know, and, and take them out of there. But it just, so I, it's a little hard for me to tell you exactly what this is going to look like, but I think I understand how to measure it. And it's just that we're going to be able to see growth in our communities without a corresponding growth in the personnel that's required to serve them. Good answer. Scott, last point. I'll, I'll very brief. I think it's a market improvement in the empowerment of our employees, uh, a market improvement in the empowerment of our residents with information and data. And then, frankly, a broader category is Indiana, I think at times we suffer from a very kind of folksy or anecdotal approach to public policy making. And I would love to see a market improvement in the level of sophistication behind which we make our policy decisions. That was a, a great panel. And before you thank them, maybe let's have uh, your Starship guy thank them first. This, this, is your, this is your refreshment as a result of your hard work. Thank our panel, please. There you go. You're allowed to get in there and get something out if you're a boiler maker, it says on the side. Yeah.